Hello, hello. Am I audible? Okay, good. Ah, softer. A uh, lot of start and stop. So uh, today, if you notice, we are talking about approximation algorithm. So Fahad already introduced approximation algorithm. So these are polynomial time algorithms, which may not give you the optimum solution. But we are still trying to show that in polynomial time, we are able to get solution which is close to optimal. OK. So I'm going to talk about this load balancing problem. So the, like I have roughly two to three problems that, and let's see how much we are able to cover. So you are given some M identical machines, OK? And N jobs, and every job has some processing time, like some TK, OK? And your job is to assign these like your task is to assign jobs to these machines such that some constraints are met. And what is the constraint? You don't want any one machine to work a lot and other machine to work little less, right? So you want to have a, you know, you want to, you know, assign jobs to this machine in a way that amount of time any machine take is as small as possible. Okay. So so what is the load of a machine? So load of a machine is basically, look at all the jobs that have been assigned to this machine, and look at the total time it will take if you sum up the time taken by each of the jobs. Okay? So that's the load of the machine. See, load is everywhere. OK. OK. I mean, and it makes sense to define load in this way. This is the total time for which this machine is going to work, right? OK. And there's something called make span is the maximum load on any machine L. Okay, So the make span is basically, what is the maximum load any machine has? So uh, you know this idea of min max is in everything you do naturally, because you want to minimize, but like if there are several activities, like what is the best, worst? So worst is the maximum among this. And what is our goal? I want to minimize the bad, or the maximum. OK? OK. And, uh, Load balancing is basically assign each job to a machine to minimize maximum. So that's it. So is the question clear? We have certain machines, certain job, and our job is to find, right? So for example, if you have M classes and some N lectures, maybe in IIT now, nowadays, you see they have some 45 minutes lecture, some 75 minutes lecture, some 90 minutes lecture, a right? different lecture. And you want to schedule that, you know, you don't want to you know like keep on generating as many classes as you want. You have certain number of classes, and you and of course, I mean, if we really do realistic situation, you also have to see that a that there's only that many hours and things of this nature. But here's the natural applications of this kind of problem. So basically, it's like you're giving a scheduling for anything. Yes. Oh, are they allowed to? No. If uh, can you interrupt a class? If a 60 minute class is there, like 15 minutes now and then 15, no, that was a joke. Okay. So yeah, they are not allowed. Like once you assign a job, it must be finished on that machine. Okay. Is that fine? So what is yes? Any machine can take any job. So look, more and more constraint you add, you get more and more difficult and difficult problem because you're adding more and more constraint. Right? So for example, yeah. So yeah, so more and more general make span problem or load balancing problem you will see. I mean, so for example, like if you have a three kinds of trains, like meter gauge or broad gauge and all, I mean, they all are different work. So there are similarly different machines, and some job can only fit into certain machines. So you are very right. We can have also kinds of machines. So, but in the this problem, we are only talking about identical machines, and every job can be assigned to any of these machines. Is that fine? It's like most simplistic model. Okay. What is the if you were the one who were assigning, who were making this schedule, what will you do? No, no, will not sort. Like this this is this is knowledge. Don't use knowledge. If you have seen it, then there's there's absolutely no point talking about it. Then there's no fun. Yeah, you can't sort. Imagine that you were, uh, suppose you were, like, 
imagine the, who makes your schedule. Most of the times, administration makes your schedule, right? Or do they know sorting? So what will they do? Of course, if they, when it will be bad, some faculty from here get, hey, this schedule looks bad. Let me write a program, and he will do all the great things. But first, how will admins do? Randomly or arbitrarily? The difference between randomly and arbitrarily. OK? Assign where? Machines. Yeah. So I try to assign some arbitrary order. I say, OK, let's assign to this machine. And when the next job comes, I say, hey, who is free? Let's just put it there. That's it. Right? That could be one way forward. And the most natural algorithm that people do is the following. Okay, so like which has worked so far. So which is so I look at the machine and I assign the current job on the machine which is like which has been say ideal for the most time or or, or to the machine because what is your goal? You do not want to make any machine work much more. So if there's a machine which has worked least at this point of time when this job comes, let's I'll say okay, go put that job to this. That's it. OK, and that gives you this algorithm. OK, so this is a code. So li denotes the load on a machine i, which has been initiated. And ji tells us which jobs have been assigned to this machine. right? So now what I do, I go through this 1 to n. I find machine has the lowest what you call make span or time. If there are many, I just you, you know break ties arbitrarily and assign that job to this. So this is what is happening. So J, so whatever jobs you have been assigned, Jth's job is also assigned. And we take it's now how much time it is going to take? It is going to take time. Li is like, oh, you were taking time Li. Now that I have assigned machine to you, your total time that you will take is Tj. So at the end of this, basically, if you notice, maximum of this Li is your max span. Right? Is that fine? And of course, I mean, you can. You can implement this algorithm much, much more faster. But yeah, it's written there, priority queue. But even if it is not, like some poly time will definitely work. OK? OK. So how bad will this be with respect to optimal? Yeah, but like, yeah. So suppose best. Uh, like imagine that best scheduling could make say uh, no machine works for more than ten unit of time. How much this can do? Okay. Yeah, that's right. That will be at most twice. Why can you support your intuition? Correct. Okay. There is some iota of truth in her intuition. Anybody else? Okay. Let's make formal whatever she said just now. So this was given by. Graham in 1966, way before even NP completeness was defined. So people needed this kind of scheduling much before, you know, people knew how to prove NP hardness and this. So I'm saying that a lot of task, lots of problem has much richer history, much richer or much older history than we formally defined what TCS, what algorithms, what polynomial time, what NP completeness meant, because people needed these kind of job assignments, right? So, for example, the mess, most is like look at the tracks, you know, or look at the airplane scheduling. All these are normal scheduling things. You know, there are tracks, how much gaps you have to give between them, you know, like if you have a big plane, how much difference between them, right? So, big plane, for example, when it, if you have this, uh, what is that called? When it takes off, 
you need to have some five minutes gap. But if you have a smaller plane, they're certain. So you need to, you know, like interleave these things in a scheduling in a way that no, what are they called? Runways, like, like empty for. So these are like very naturally occurring scheduling questions, right? And they are like, and for most practical purposes, most tracks or most runways are like identical machines, right? I mean, it doesn't matter, right? If it is long enough, any of any types of plane can land. So now, but you still, because if this guy goes, there is seven minutes window, that guy goes, there's three minutes window. So now each of this, the different jobs and you need. So people have been doing these kind of things way, way before we came in and tried to be smart. Okay, which we will be in a minute. Okay, so, and so basically we have to, whenever you are doing approximation algorithm, you have to compare with what optimal did without knowing what optimal did and what you did. So you need to derive some sort of lower bound on optimum and say, hey, if whatever happens, optimum must be taking this much. And you have to relate without knowing that optimum to whatever you are doing. Okay. So there are a few simple observations that you can notice. What let like L star be the optimum mix span. Look, you will assign some every job to some machine, right? So whatever is the maximum time any job takes, whatever may be the max span, whoever makes this schedule, that much time it will take, right? So this is all that it says. It is like very trivial. Is that fine? Right? Okay. And let's do another trivial observation. Okay. Look, there are M machines and on the first machine, suppose you have L1, second machine L2, L3, L. But what is summation of Li? It's summation of time, total time. So by pigeonhole principle, one machine will take one by M of that, right? That's just pigeonhole principle, right? If I have a five, like, if you have five holes and there are six pigeons, so there is one hole with two pigeons. That's all. That's it. Right? It's like, yeah, six by five. So this is exactly what it is. Anybody else? Anybody has a question on this? You look very, you don't look happy. Huh? Is it fine? Yeah. So say, it's fine. Imagine yourself. Uh, okay. Oh, it's right. So this is machine one. This is a total. This is a time. This is another time on the second machine. Right? Now notice that every job is assigned to only one machine, no? Okay. So if I sum, if I sum this time plus this time and this time, total time of each of them, will it be equal to the total total time of each of the job? So that's exactly summation TJ is. Okay. Now summation TJ is a quantity, right? Now if every machine takes, and there are M machines, if every machine takes strict by M. Is it possible? Right? Because total is summation TJ. So if everybody, so imagine the total is 10 and we have four machines. If every machine took 10 by, what is 10 by 4? It's 2.5. Every machine took less than 2.5, like 2.4, then how much the whole total of the four machine is? It's less than 10, right? So it's nothing more than that. It's just an average. Okay. Once we are done with this two small lemma, we are ready to prove the, okay. So I'm going to consider, so now, as I told you, right, I have to, what is a mix span? Basically, I have to say that the worst load of any machine is not too bad. Because if we are able to compare the worst load of any machine with the best load and say, hey, the worst load is not worse than two times the best load, then we are done because we have done things for the worst machine. So consider the load Li of the bad machine I. So like, let's the machine which takes the most amount of time be I and its load be Li and that's the worst. So we'll try to see how, what can we say about the load of this machine. Okay. And look at this, look at the last job that you assign to it. Okay. So this is my ith machine whose load is Li, which is the worst among all the loads. Okay. But now I look back, I said, hey, look at this. 
And look at the last job that I assigned to him, Job J. Why did you assign Job J to him? Because that is the time it was the least work machine compared to everybody else. So this is what this picture is telling you that look at this machine I. I did not assign this job, red job J, to other machine because other machine had some job assigned already, which will take more time. So it was going to be ideal. So this is what it is, right? So this picture makes it complete, clear. Okay. Now, okay. So what does it mean? It means before the TJ was assigned, right? Before TJ was assigned, Li minus TJ was less than the load of any other machine, right? Including itself, because real load of ith machine is Li minus TJ plus TJ. So of course it is less than Li, right? So that's all that it says. Whatever we just showed in the picture, I'm writing it. That the Li minus TJ, the load of ith machine, when I did not add TJ, was least compared to the load of everybody else at that point. It may be even more later, but even at that point, this load was smaller among all. So when I add more things to those machines, it can load is any way more, right? So that's all that it says. There's nothing more to that. Is that fine? Okay. And this picture tells you everything. Okay. So once we are ready with those two simple observations, we are ready to prove our thing. So what did we last learn? That now we know that Li minus Tj is less than Lk for all k between 1 and n. Just let's sum them, all these inequalities. So if I sum these inequality, what I'm going to get? So Li minus Tj, so m times Li minus Tj is less than summation k Lk. So I just took m from the left side and I divided from there. That's it. So basically, what is this? You take this inequality and you sum them for all. So you will get m times li minus tj less than or equal to summation li i equal to 1 to k. Right? And I then I wrote li minus tj is less than or equal to 1 over m quantity. Right? Okay. But what is summation of lk? What is summation of lk? Summation of all times, right? So that's it. So this is okay. And what does lemma one tells us? This is less than I think lemma one or lemma two. Someone, yeah. So this quantity is less than L star. Is that fine? Okay. Now what is L i load of ith machine is L minus T j. I shouldn't, this is my bad. It should be Li minus Tj plus Tj. What is Li minus Tj? I showed it is less than L star, right? And Tj, any load, like any Ti is less than L star because of the lemma one. This should be lemma two. This is lemma two. My bad. Okay? Is that fine? Are we done? We're done. There's nothing more to this, right? So what we have shown is that I said, hey, so you see, I took the worst load and tried to relate it to optimum without knowing it. And we used two small inequalities. What are the two small inequalities? Look, any load best, like even the best scheduling cannot take less than the worst time of a work. That was one thing. And average time of this thing, if I took summation, whatever may be the scheduling be, even the best one has there, should, there has to have a one machine which will work one over m of total time. That's it. So if you have these two inequality, you can do something. Is that fine? All good? Like, have we understood everything so that we don't go out and we have to still understand? Okay. So is our analysis tight? So is this analysis of our algorithm tight? Do you think? That is just that this particular algorithm, which we just now did, is like actually performs much, much better, but it's just that we are not able to analyze it. Okay? But actually, it's not true because imagine yourself, uh, the essentially, this analysis is fully tight. And so you take some M machines of length one and one job of length M. Okay? So, for example, M equal to 10. Right? And your scheduling is like 
that you first put all the one length job and then you put 10 length job. What will happen then? So what were you saying? At any point of time, so first you will fill the first column, right? Because all the one unit of job is coming. So first you fill the first column, then you will fill the second column, then you will fill the third column. So 90 jobs has come. So you have filled up this column and then this 10 guy has come, which you will schedule in one of the machines because everybody is equal at that point of time. So how much was the total time? 19. But what would have been? So but imagine that 10 would have come first and then singletons would have come. Then you would have put 10 and then 1, 1, 1. Just like this, right? So imagine the 10 would have come first, then I put 10, and then one comes, then remaining machines, one, 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 one. So the total time span is 10. So what does it mean that if you go into an arbitrary order, then it is possible that the same algorithm can perform, uh, what do you call it? Like depending on which order you are processing your jobs matters. At least for that greedy algorithm, it is important. If you do arbitrary, it's like we cannot do better than two. But it is possible that if we feed the same algorithm, not in any arbitrary order, but we decide in which order we do this algorithm. Okay. But notice what is important about this algorithm is very is something which you have to remember. Is that imagine yourself that you have a stream of jobs coming. You don't see. All, I did not tell you all the jobs a priori. A priori. I did not tell you the, your jobs a priori. Like at any point of time, a job comes and you have to make decision where it goes. Right? Like, so jobs are coming in an online fashion. I have not given you all the jobs. If all the information you have is that at any point of time, you know what machines, what, which one is working, how much, this is information you have, and say, hey, new job has come, assigned. Now, you don't see a job which went in the past. You don't see a new job which will come in the future. Then what will you do? This algorithm still works. right? So in fact, this is what is called online algorithms, where jobs or the object is coming in the stream, and you have to make a decision then and there. You don't see future. You don't see past. right? Then this algorithm is great. Okay? But if you can see everything, which is also possible, maybe we can do better. Right? So in the world of online algorithm, this is more or less optimum in terms of competitive ratio or whatever that means. So if in the online setting, this is a best algorithm that we are aware of. Okay? But if it is not online algorithm, but we know everything, then we know that our scheduling is sensitive to the way or the order with which we need to assign, in which the jobs come. Right? So maybe there is a better way of coming up with the ordering, as he was, Ajay was telling in the beginning, is that, hey, sort them and then do something. Okay, maybe that will be beneficial. But when we have no other information, this is the best we can hope for. Okay? Okay. So now, let's see what, let's look at his algorithm. So this is what, longest processing time. So our heuristic is, first we sort the jobs, first, so what is the first job? Job which takes the longest time, then the second longest time, third longest time, I sorted them, and now I do the same algorithm. Algorithm doesn't change, right? It's only the order in which we feed the jobs had changed. So we pre-process in the beginning. I said, oh, let me use the same algorithm, but I will not give him any arbitrary order, but I will give him in a way I have already pre-decided. Is that fine? Okay. So if that is the case, then both the inequalities we used for the previous lemma, it holds here also. Because those two inequalities were OK with irrespective of what order we gave them. Look, whatever may be the scheduling be, some machine has to take the bad guy. That's it. Right? Some machine has to have an average of total time. Why will that change, whether you change this way or that way? And how does it going to change? Those were independent of how your, these machines are coming, or how these jobs are assigned. OK? That's it. So sort the jobs, and this is the same algorithm. Nothing changed. But now, OK? 
OK. So now we are going to use slightly better inequalities. So what it means, imagine, so first of all, if I told you I have m machines and, and m jobs, can you do it in polynomial time? m machines, m jobs. Give one job to every machine. So if you have more machines than job, then you can always do optimally. Just assign one to each of them, and you're happy. So that case, actually, we can solve in polynomial time. So we have to believe that we have more jobs. OK, m plus 1. Excellent. OK, so what does this tell us? So if there are more than m jobs, look at the m plus 1th job. There are m machines only, no? So two jobs he will assign to some machine, right? Pigeon hole principle. M, M holes, M plus one pigeons. So there is a hole with two pigeons. OK. So look at the two jobs that you have assigned to that. M plus one was the smallest number, no? So that guy, among the first M plus one, will assign two jobs. But the total time on that machine is M plus one plus other M plus one, at least. Maybe more. But we don't. we cannot guarantee, because it's possible that everybody has the same job. Like, Time, processing time. So is this fine? Is this fine? That L star is at least two times t into m plus 1. Is that fine? Like, what is m plus 1's job? So in the sorted order, this is the m plus 1's job. Is that OK? Now we are done. Why? OK. So we go back. We write. L i is L, uh, L minus tj plus tj, right? What is L minus tj? We know that it is less than L star by doing those m inequality. But the time tj is how much? Huh? Is less than, we are only talking about higher. So that is like L star is going to be. Uh, T, uh, Tm plus 1 is great, what you call less than or equal to L star by 2. So I just substituted Tj with L star by 2. That's it. And I'm done. So that is 3 by 2 L star, right? So I just use the inequality. So look at, we said the worst, like L star is at least worst job. But now I have a better inequality. That, so if I have a better inequality, I'm able to use that. Is that fine? That's it. This is a 3 by 2 factor approximation. Any question? Yes. Yes. Why? Because this is the last job that is assigned on this machine. Right? So every guy will assign at least first. Right? So this Tj is only be going to be greater than or equal to m plus 1, no? The last job that is assigned to the bad machine, the last job, it cannot be first M plus first M, no? Because then we know how to report because this is M plus one. That's why. So we are using the fact that the last job that will be assigned to any machine is that index is going to be M plus one and further ahead. Okay, so that's a factor three by two approximation. Is our 3 by 2 analysis tight? No, it's not. So there is a theorem by Graham that this rule actually gives you 4 by 3 factor approximation, not 3 by 2. So you can actually prove 4 by 3 approximation, but that's a bit far too complicated. I try to read it, and it's like, looks. I mean, you need to use much more properties. And actually, 4 by 3 analysis is tight. Example is there, but like, let's just leave it for now. OK? So uh, these are like two very basic algorithm. But the question could be asked, is it possible that we can get even better than 4 by 3 approximation? Right? Is it better that we can get better than 4 by 3 approximation? And as, as far as I remember, actually, this you can get much better approximation than 4 by 3. It has actually what is called polynomial time approximation scheme, which Fahad will talk about. But again, that is beyond the scope of what I can teach you in half an hour. OK? So, but I just wanted to know you that 
you can do actually do better than four by three, but that is not going to be this algorithm. Like it will be something else. Okay. So <clears throat> similar the way in the world of polynomial time, we say, hey, given a problem, can I do it in poly time or NP complete? So that's one question. So in the world of approximation of the mask, okay, here's an approximation. Can I do better approximation? Or I can prove it is even NP hard to approximate better than this. You understand? Like, so I'll be like, can I keep going, improving, improving, or there's a threshold after which I shouldn't be able to do it? Huh? Uh, let's see. Oh, God. Where will I find? It says no results found. On my machine, no? What is it? IT? Faculty because they know it's sort of stable like that. Queen it is. Okay, so <clears throat> sorry for the interruption. We are in the technical world, so machine can also fail, right? Then what happens? You have put up a job and machine fails. Example, you're in the lift and lift stops. Something can happen, right? How do you model those situations, right? So then people talk about, oh no, we need to have a one safe, two safe networks and blah, blah, blah. Especially during COVID times, no? <clears throat> okay, so that was one example that I want to tell you. And here's my bare backbone of, you know, people so whenever I have to sell people, you know, that whatever I want to say, hey, you machine learning guys, you should know. Or if I want to, if nobody is attending my class, I send an email, hey, today I'm going to teach you something which will be useful in machine learning and then people will show up. But what I teach them, how to do center selection. Okay. And if, even if that doesn't work out, then I'll give them an approximation for K mean, K median, and then everybody comes running. Okay. So, yeah. So I, I was planning to... I was, I'm planning to design a course where you say, hey, everything which is useful for your job interview, and then teach the same thing. Huh? Yes, I know. That's exactly my point. Like, how to boost the attendance in the class. So I'll tell you, this is a real thing. So one day I was taking their class, and there were like 50 to 55 students. And then I told, oh, whatever I'm teaching today could be useful in uh, your job. And then somehow this message was sent to everybody. And in next five minutes, the number of people who are attending class were like 125, 130 out of 160. So it does work. So they all have network. People are like, sleep. oh, job. Let me open the window. OK. So this is one such problem, which some variation of that people do ask in most interviews. And that's a fact. OK? So you, if you go to interview for decent companies, they will ask you some variations of this. But if you know this algorithm, you will be able to handle those variations. So this is the most basic backbone approximation for a very basic problem. So what is this? So you are you have to select. So you are given some n sites, okay, right? And you have to select k. What do you call it? k? Again, gone. Uh, 
अब तो अब तो इसको रीस्टार्ट ही करना पड़ेगा अब मैं ऑनलाइन हूं कि नहीं अब मैं ऑनलाइन अच्छा ठीक है इस बार इस बार सो कैन यू गिव मी वन व्हाट इज दैट कॉल प्रैक्टिकल एप्लीकेशन ऑफ दिस शॉपिंग मॉल्स ओनली व्हाट इज दिस हु इज फ्रॉम इज देयर समवन फ्रॉम यूएस Oh, you're from US. Excellent. Where do you want to have your house? Now, where do people in US likes to have their house? No, no, no. That's okay. But like in any city, where do they like to have their house? That's one thing. But most people who have children, they like to live in a place where they have a good schools. Okay. Okay. So why? So what does it mean? Right. So. you do not want you want to say open up good schools so that everybody like it don't no people students have don't have to go too far away because traveling for children is very you know it's not nice because now this is why notice that most people or most school actually now at least for kindergarten and all this they say we will we will only give you admission if your house is within some radius of 5 km and 6 km right so then this is a very natural question now that you have a city you want and some locality you want to have good schools in this so that every child can go to a good school within the radius of 5 km right so it's a very natural question okay so like everywhere i hear this mall but this is like it's okay nowadays malls are useless anyway you can grow from insta mart so what is the point of opening malls but school children still can't go to this okay and this was someone asked actually to some people in the interview now that you cannot give me this example of i read at kora now that you cannot give me this example of supermarket and this because in covid everything was closed still everything came but now that covid is open what is one thing that you can still use this algorithm for and there was one clever guy he said school so yeah hmm So in the next time in your job interview, they ask you give different example, and there are many more examples. And this is not something which is you can think of like a sports field, so that people don't have to travel. But like in India, who cares about sports field? So that will not. But school still people care. Huh? Hospitals, right? Now what kind of hospitals? Like, up type? What is that called? Uh, Mohalla clinic, or we need for heart. i mean i'm not even talking about government hospital like like do you have a speciali specialty like heart specialty this because i mean people are dying from heart attack quite often till the technology is sorted you can tell me more stories ha huh? fire station please ask computer architecture no no there should be there has to have a connection it's just that like i do not know architecture that well to tell but there has to have a connection because after scheduling Uh, no so like when you say slowest so the big job is the slowest job no that's why i'm trying to process it first don't think from the profit so what what is this lpt rule is the lpt rule is basically hey which job takes the most time assign it first right so in that sense this is exactly what it is right so what you say slow what is how you define slow is the one which is going to take long time right now assuming first of all there are many assumptions here that this computer architecture every units are equally fast this which may not be right so there are anybody i don't know what anything what computer architecture i have not studied computer science so i don't know okay i don't call my like i have not studied computer science in my undergrads only only practical courses which i was forced to take which i took was compiler and databases nothing more 
And I have not written a program after 2006. So that is the last time when I wrote a program. After that, I don't write program, I write pseudo program. You know what a pseudo program is? No. Like, take this, do this. Yeah. Pseudo code. Yeah, so I call pseudo program. Like, I don't care about syntax. You understand? The difference between a pseudo program is that in one, you have to care about syntax. Huh? Ah, yeah, of course, there will be more in my slides. Okay. Here's my. This is a pseudo code. I mean, which programming language can implement this? No. But like you have to put it in a different data structures and everything. Okay. Okay, now that we are back. Okay. So you understood the question, right? So we so what is our goal? Our goal is to put up this center so that no site is too far away and from any of this. So like you want to the distance from any site to the centers, right? Formally, what it means is, so let's fix up some notation. So what is the distance between x, y? So distance between x, y is the distance between x, y. And distance between s, a site and a c is like, which is the closest center to me? You're not able to read this? It's like, imagine that, what will, how will you define closest? You have the 10 hospitals, which is the closest hospital? That's it. So this is exactly what it means. Distance S comma C is the shortest distance to one of these guys. So take the distance to everybody one, take the minimum, you're done. But okay. And what is R of C? Like, okay, which site has the maximum distance to the center? Like, that is the guy which is the bad guy. Okay? I mean, he is the one who is penalized. Okay, notation. And now we have to find a center C that minimizes the maximum distance anybody has to travel to center. Maximum distance from a site to one of the centers. Subject to the constraint that you are only allowed to put K centers. Otherwise, you will say, hey, K, why do I have to go anywhere? Make hospital in my home. But making, but for this, you can say very well that, you know, we can't have heart hospital in everybody's house. Okay, but, and this distance functions satisfy some properties. What is the property? Distance to itself is zero. Distance between me and you and you to me is same because we can say, use the left, left track going there and right track going from that side. So that's fine. And they follow the triangle inequality, right? Going to, going from me to you is less than him and coming to you. And what are these called? Metric. Metric. Okay. So we are only talking about on the metric. Okay. And if you're not given a metric, I don't think you can do approximation as far as I know. Okay. But this is very natural. I mean, okay. Okay, so each site is a point, for example, each site is a point in the plane and center can be any point in the plane and distance is like Euclidean distance, but then search can be infinite. Which one to place? Look, if I don't tell you where to place your this thing, then it could be infinite, which is, a, which is actually true. Like, we are, like you, you say locations, but like which location to choose for your hospitals? I mean, it is not determined. Oh, you can only put here. You can only. So it's a very natural constraint that we don't know. Like we, apparently, we know. Okay. And here's a bad greedy choice. What is the bad greedy choice? At any point of time, you try to minimize the yes. No, I'm working in metric space. It is just an example. Like, how do I like how do I represent? 35 dimensional space. I don't know. So let's just, just to get, build your intuition. Okay. So what I'm saying, if you put the first center at the best possible location for a single center, for example, then this, is, this choice is very bad. And keep adding centers as to reduce the covering radius. So for example, what I mean, imagine that head set of sites, head set of sites, where will you put the first? So that you can minimize the distance. So basically think of this as a line, right? And here's your client, here's your client. Where will you put? Of course in the middle. 
and then you are dead. Where will you put the second one? Right? It could be arbitrarily bad. Right? This could be, because if I had two centers, I could have just kept one here, kept one here. I would have been much happier. But now, because of this, I could just make them as far as possible. The first guy you're going to put here, now second guy where? Whom do I minimize? So this choice that let's try to do this is bad. Okay? This greedy choice is bad. Okay. But this greedy algorithm always works. Okay? It's like I have selected some set of centers and I'm going to put who? Where I put the next center? I said, okay, let's someone who is the farthest from these centers, let's go to that guy, put my center there. Okay. Why this works is a different case, but like this is my greedy choice. You understood what it what it tells us? What we are doing? So at any point of time, we have some set of centers. Now you say which site is the from this already selected centers, some site, there could be several sites, then you choose arbitrary site and you place your center there. It also resolves one, one of our problem. The algorithm we are designing is setting up these centers on the site locations. Notice, this algorithm is not searching over infinite. It, I'm not saying this is going to give you the best solution, but this algorithm is placing its center on the sites itself, right? So looks at the sites and it is going to place k centers at some of the sites itself so in that sense its search space is bounded by this is why this algorithm can be implemented in polynomial time and firstly first site can be placed at anywhere first center can be placed at anywhere right so just decide to put the first site and then what where will the next site look at the site which is the farthest from here you go and put this and when the third you look at the object which is the farthest from this, you will go and place it. For example, okay. Both, Far, like a point, what is the farthest? So every point can be defined farthest from a set, right? You don't. This is a dis difference. The distance between a site and already selected center is what is the minimum I can go, which is the closest to me, that's my distance. So now, after I have selected some five, every site for which we don't have center can decide, right, which is, what is the distance to my center? Everybody has decided, right? Among them, I choose the one which number is largest, and I go and place a center there. Is that fine? Okay, upon termination, all centers in C are paired by at least RC apart. Why? So what I'm saying to you is, so at the end, suppose I have selected a centers here, centers here, centers here, centers here, centers here, right? Each of these centers are actually quite far from each other. Why? Huh? So that point is farthest. Why does it mean that every point in between is that far away from each other? Look, this is saying something. Suppose this is my center one, center two, center three, center four. Why if I pick up any CI and CJ, they are very far from each other? Huh? Okay. Is everybody satisfied with because I'm not? Okay. Because if you all are satisfied, then I have nothing to prove. Then I go next page and I do my algorithm. Yes. Yes. So what is RC? So there is some point here, which is farthest from all these guys, right? This is R of C. Yeah. Okay. 
And now we have to show, wait, now we have to show that if I pick up any CI and CJ, that is far apart. So that is because, as some of you have said, so look at CI and so look at some CJ and suppose J was coming after this, right? Now, look at other point. Why did I put this guy as this? Because the distance from C, look, look at this RC, this guy, which is up, up until then, this guy could only be larger. It cannot be a smaller distance. But you did not decide to put that. You did not decide to put CJ there because CJ was even further from CIs, and that is why the distance between any CI and CJ is at least RC. You get my point? So when I, when we were considering to put where to put in the jth round, where to put our center, we would have considered this point. Let's call this point X. We would say, hey, put on X, but you decided not to put it on X, but some other point. Why? Because that point was even further from these guys. And at that point of time, look, more and more center I put, this guy's distance can only decrease. It can never increase. And that's it. So every, I, every two people that I've selected in this is very far from each other. I could have also, I mean, look, if I knew the covering radius, then my algorithm would have been very simple. Put that first side, find some other guy which is farthest, like more than RC, say, not just RC, I put it on another one. Next time, take another point which is more RC away from each other or some two RC, as he says, and that will them also would work. But we don't know what R of C is. Okay? But that doesn't matter for the analysis. Okay? Is that fine? So now are we okay with this observation that when the algorithm terminates, when the algorithm does terminate, two points are at least R of C far apart. Okay? Okay, so now let's see a star B optimal set of centers. I want to see that covering radius with respect to C stars and covering radius with respect to C is not too far away. And how do I? I am going to say, assume that the covering radius of C star is less than, like, or covering radius of C is more than two times of optimum. What happens this? If that is the case, I'm going to say, okay, let's look at every point in our center and let's draw a ball of half radius around these. Okay? So you understand what I'm, what I'm doing? I said, suppose this statement is not true, like the centers which we have provided, the covering radius of this is more than twice of the optimum guy and say, if that is the case, let's just draw the half balls around each of these guys. First observation is, OK, so we, have, we are considering this. Now, let's see where are these optimal centers are placed. My claim is, in every ball, there should be one optimal center. Why? Because if you don't put a center, then who will cover that center? Right? So if I do not have blue guys here, then who will cover this black guy? Look, optimal centers also covers every point, no? Within the radius of R of C star. So now I have taken a ball of half of RC. It means it is more than RC star. So if you who will cover this? Okay. Or rather, what is half of RC? This radius is more than R of C star. And this point is also covered by some gone, right? In the blue guys. So if that blue guy is outside this circle, who will cover this center guy? Which means that every ball contains at least one center. OK? And since this is K, it's exactly. OK. OK. I think now we are done. Look at any point S. Look at any point S, any point. He knows that he can reach to one of the blue guys in RC star. And from there, I can go to the, my C guys in other RC stars. That's it. So that's all that it is. So if you apply triangle inequality, consider any site S and its closure center CI star in S. So what is distance S to C? Is upper bounded by distance S to go to CI star, and then you go CI star to CI. That's it. And you are done. Is that fine? Any more questions? And that's it. You are done.
Okay? I think that's all that I had time for. I will, then we can have 10 minutes break and then, uh, okay, no. Okay, so I'm, I have to make one remark before I give it to uh, Vimal. So this is a greedy approximation for center selection problem. Is there any hope for three by two approximation, four by three approximation? Do you think it's possible to do? Actor two approximation. Hopefully, Vimal will tell you that unless p equal to np, we cannot do 1.99 approximation. At least when we are working in general metric space. If we are working in Euclidean metric, we can do much, much better. Like example, these points are really in plane, then we can do much better. But like if I only thing which I told you about these points, that they satisfy these three inequality, then this is the best you can hope for. And this reduction, have you, have you done this NP completeness reduction for centers? That should do the job. OK, that's it. So that's all that I had time for. So let's take a 10 minutes coffee break and 15 minutes coffee break. And then so let's say 15 minutes coffee break, and we can come back at 12.20, and then Bimal can take. Thank you. Oh, this is a break then? Water break. <laughs> 